Our final presenter this afternoon is Benjamin Kraft, who's going to talk to us about entries of random matrices. So let's start with a bit of linear algebra. We call a matrix orthogonal if it has real entries such that the matrix times its transpose is the identity. Equivalently, we can say the, matrix, the rows, or equivalently the columns, are orthonormal vectors. What this really means is that the transformation that the matrix corresponds to doesn't change the shape or size of objects it acts on. And we're going to call the group of orthogonal matrices ON. The corresponding case with complex entries is called unitary matrices, where the matrix times its conjugate transpose is the identity. Again, we can equivalently say that the rows are equivalently the columns are orthonormal, and we call these UN. If we have a matrix A, a vector X, and a, a scalar lambda such that AX equals lambda X, we call lambda an eigenvalue of A, and X is the corresponding eigenvector. Now, when we're talking about real, uh, orthogonal and unitary matrices, the absolute value of our eigenvalues is always going to be 1. So now we've dealt with the matrix. What about random? If I gave you a finite set of matrices and told you to pick a random one, you could do that. But there are infinitely many matrices, uh, unitary matrices. So how do we pick a random one? Well, it turns out we can use a general concept called Haar measure, which gives us a natural method of choosing a random unitary or orthogonal matrix such that the probability of picking a matrix from a set A is the same as the probability of picking a matrix from a matrix M multiplied by that set A. Basically, what this means is that each matrix is equally likely to be selected. For example, if we pick the, take the first column of a number of random 3 by 3 orthogonal matrices, we get a uniform distribution on the sphere, just as you would expect. So now we know how these things are defined. What do they look like? Well, one way to look at matrices is through their eigenvalues. And it turns out that the eigenvalues, which have to be on the unit circle, repel each other. What I mean by that is this. The, if we pick 50 independently random complex numbers on the unit circle, you'll notice there are some gaps. There are some clumps. Um, this is because each new eigenvalue we add is just as equally likely to fall near a bunch of other eigenvalues as away from them. However, if we pick the 50 eigenvalues of a 50 by 50 random unitary matrix, you see they're approximately evenly distributed. However, as we take powers of this matrix and look at the eigenvalues of those, the effect decreases. They become more independent. So you can see the eigenvalues of a to the 10th are somewhere in between the first two pictures, and the eigenvalues of a to the 50th would be completely independent, just like the first picture. Now, there's something missing here. I haven't talked about the actual entries of the matrices. Well, let's make some histograms. So we can look at the distribution. This is the distribution over the unit circle where um, of the, of the, third the first entry of the third power of a random 3 by 3 matrix. Um, now, from here on out, all our, if we plot all our distributions, they're going to be rotationally symmetrical. That is, they're independent of phase. So instead, we can plot 2D histograms that are of the density per unit area. This basically represents the cross section from 0 on the left to the edge of the unit disk on the right. Now, you can see that this distribution is uniform. But it turns out that not much is known about the entries of random matrices and their powers. Um, the, the only main result we have is due to Borel, who found the limiting distribution of the top left entry in the orthogonal case. Now, before we go any further, who cares? Well, there are intrinsic reasons to study random matrices. Um, <laughs> uh, we have. It, it's clear that there's a deeper structure to random matrices, which is not very well understood. In addition, there are applications to the Riemann zeta function, quantum mechanics, where raising, uh, taking the entries of powers of random matrices is related to the probability of getting back to a specific quantum state after taking a bunch of actions on it, or th rather the same action repeatedly. Uh, telephone encryption, where we use uh, large random matrices to encrypt data and statistical analysis where st statisticians want to know what random matrices look like so they know whether their data are really random or whether there is some correlation. So what can we discover about these matrices? Well, more histograms. We notice several things when we look at these. First, when we have p at least n, the distribution stabilizes. So you can see those three all look pretty uniform, and those two look pretty similar. In addition, when p is less than or equal to n, we get the distribution moves outward as p increases. So here it's concentrated mostly towards the center. Then it becomes a little bit less concentrated. And when we get to p equals 3, it's completely uniform. You can see the same effect when n equals 4 or when n equals 5. This brings us to our first theorem, 
which is that if n is at least 2 and a is a random n by n unitary matrix, then the first entry of a to the p has probability density function 1 minus the absolute value of zeta squared to the n minus 3 over 2 if p is at least n. Pictures. What this theorem means is that, for example, in the n equals 3 case, we get 1 minus the absolute value of zeta squared to the 0, which is just a constant. So the distribution is uniform, which is just what it looks like up here. When n equals 4, we get 1 minus the absolute value of zeta squared to the 1 half. And when n equals 5, we just get 1 minus the absolute value of zeta squared. And if you think all the way back to algebra 1, that looks kind of like a parabola. So why is this important? Well, it completely describes the distributions when the power is at least equal to the dimension of our matrix. In particular, it gives us a nice closed form. There's no reason to suspect that these, these kinds of expressions should have a nice closed form. So the fact that they do suggests that there's a deeper structure in random matrices that are raised to high powers. Now, what about the case where p is less than n? It doesn't appear that there is such a simple density function for those powers when p is less than n. What can we say? Well, let's define a, a terminology. If x and y are two random variables, then we say x is less than dot y if the expected value of the absolute value of x to the 2e is less than that of absolute value of y to the 2e for all positive integers e. What's it mean? It means x is distributed more towards the center of the unit disk, whereas y is distributed more towards the outside. Now we can state our next theorem, which says that if n is at least 2, and the ceiling of n over 2 is less than or equal to p1, is less than p2, is less than or equal to n, and a is a random n by n unitary matrix, then the first entry of a to the p1 is less than dot the first entry of a to the p2. More pictures. What this means is that this distribution is mostly concentrated towards the center, whereas this one's uniform. Similarly, we notice that it moves outwards as we go from left to right in the n equals 4 case and the n equals 5 case. This is important because it gives us some relations about the distributions when the power p is less than or equal to n. In particular, it helps us understand the effects of raising random matrices to higher powers, even when we can't necessarily understand the exact distribution of each entry. So th this also leads us to conjecture that this relation extends to all p between 1 and n instead of just between the ceiling of n over 2 and n. So in conclusion, we have an exact characterization of the distributions of the top left entries of random n by n unitary matrices raised to the pth power when p is at least n. And we have some relations when the ceiling of n over 2 is less than or equal to p, which is less than or equal to n. We also conjecture that n a direction for further work is to extend these relations to also include the case where p is between 1 and the ceiling of n over 2. Hopefully, a better understanding of the entries of powers of random matrices will help illuminate the field as a whole. I'd like to thank my mentor, Greg Menton, for all his uh, inspirational projects, um, Dr. John Rickert for his advice on how not to give a presentation, uh, Kardik Venkatram, Dr. Tanya Kavnova, and Professor David Jerison for guiding me mathematically and sharing their love of mathematics, the participants in our weekly math, math breakfast for their pain-relieving sharing of experiences, and the MIT, the MIT Math Department, RSI, CE, and Tyco Electronics, without whom none of this would have been possible. Thank you. Are there any questions? Over here. So this is probably something that doesn't have a short answer, and I'll understand if there's not much way to condense it, but what can you say about the proof techniques for example, if p is greater than or equal to n, how do you analyze the upper left corner? So The question is what you can say about the proof techniques, in particular with the p greater than or equal to n case, how can you say something about the upper left corner of the matrix? So let me use my fancy little links here.